Let's jump right in here, chapter 8. We're going to reread the first six verses. I know we just read the entire chapter. We get, get in here and get the context. There's kind of different sections where uh, there's multiple things going on in this chapter. So let's start with the first part here. First, number one, the Bible reads, Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. Now, I'm just going to pause real quick right here, because if you remember, last week in chapter 7, was the, um, the story where the Syrians had besieged the city. And there was a great famine, and, every, you know, and they, were, they were buying uh, an ass's head or four, you know, a, part, a fourth of a, a cab of dove's dung for all this money. And then uh, the lepers went out to the camp, and they, you know, they saw that everyone had fled. So there was this, this great deliverance from the, from the famine and from the, the siege. And... Um, you know, that, that whole story just finished up in chapter 7. So basically, this is, these are the next events that happen right after that. Everything is returned to normal. The economy's back to normal. People have food and are healthy again. So now we're, we're picking up where Elisha is speaking unto the woman. Now, it says here just the woman whose son he had restored to life. That's talking about the Shunammite woman. The, the woman that, that made a little, uh, little place for him to come and stay. Remember, she was inviting him to eat while he traveled and passed through. And then after a few times, she decided, you know what, let's make a place for him to stay, a little bed and a place for him to, to rest. And um, was being very hospitable towards him. And, of course, she was blessed with having a child. And um, the child ended up dying. She went to Elisha. Elisha brought him back to life, and that's, that's who this is referring to now. So now she's getting some information from Elisha, Elisha being a prophet, saying, hey, there's going to be a famine in the land for seven years. So he's like, just get out of here because there's going to be a famine here. Go sojourn, stay temporarily anywhere that you could find that's, that's going to be in a better condition than here, and then, and then you can come back. So that's what happens. Verse number two says, And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold... The woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land, even until now. It's interesting that we see this woman coming up again. In, in the book of 2 Kings, you kind of, you know, we've already gotten through all these great stories and miracles that had happened involving this woman, from her having a child, the child being raised back to life. But here she is again, and you, you see the great faith that this lady had. You see when she was told, hey, there's going to be a famine here. Now look, it's not easy to just pick up everything and just go and move somewhere else. And she did all of this just based on faith because the man of God said so. Because the man of God was prophesying, hey, there's going to be a famine. So she believed him. And, it, I mean, it worked out great for her, right? She believed him and was able to go off into the land of the Philistines for seven years. But then we see what happens is when she comes back, obviously there's some problems because she just left her land basically desolate. She, she just picked up and moved with her house and everything else. So she left her property behind. She left everything behind. And when she, come back, she came back, apparently there was a problem with someone else probably taking over her land and you know cultivating her land and everything else so she has to go to the king and be like hey you know this is my rightful land now someone else is in here you know taking it over i've been gone for seven years but now i'm back you know i need to get my land back but this is this shows you th these types of events happen and there's no way this is a coincidence and that's why it's written in the bible for us today to read is that this is not just some coincidence that the king just so happens to be talking to Gehazi 
and just so happens to be talking about Elisha, and they're going through these stories. They say, you know, tell me some stories about Elisha, about the man of God. Because Gehazi was Elisha's servant, right? So he was traveling around with them. He was around during all these different things. Gehazi was right there when this woman's son was brought back to life. So as he's telling the king this story, I mean, he's literally in the middle of telling the story of, yeah, he brought this, 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 you know, this child back to life. In walks the very woman who's looking to get her land restored unto her again. And he's like, and here she is, right? You know, this is, this is the woman. This is exactly who I'm talking about. You know, you'd say, wow, what a crazy coincidence. Well, no, it's not a coincidence. See, this woman is being blessed by God tremendously because of her faith, because of her hospitality. The Bible says um, in 2 Peter 2, verse number 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to deliver godly people out of temptations, out of trials. That's why she got the, the warning. Hey, there's going to be a famine. She was living godly and righteously, and she was a good woman, and God decided to bless her and allow, you know, so Elisha can tell her, hey, this is what's going on. So she was able to avoid that. She was removed from that famine. She didn't have to go through all of that trials and, uh, and temptation. She was delivered from that. And um, in Proverbs 3, 6, the Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. See, when you live a life where you're completely reliant on God, when you have great faith and you could just trust in what the word of God is, trust the prophet of the Lord here, Elisha, who's preaching God's words. The decisions that you make based on that information is going gonna, is gonna to lead you the right path every time. So, it's all started off with her helping him out, right? Oh, the Bible says this too. Right? One, more, one, one last place. So you don't have to turn there. Very, very familiar passage. Galatians 6, verse number 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now it's important to read in context all the way up to verse 10 there in Galatians 6 about reaping what you sow. Because it's easy to stop just after the first verse or two. Yeah, you're going to reap what you sow. But it continues on to say, you know, therefore, so because we know this, let's do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. This is exactly what the Shunammite woman did. She was good, especially unto the man of faith. I mean, she took, uh, um, you know, her own time and resources and energy to help out Elisha the prophet way early on. You know, when she wasn't looking for anything for herself, she was genuinely just trying to help and be a blessing and help the man of God. And as a result of her actions and her heart and her doing good, especially under those of the, you know, the house of, household of God, she was blessed in return. She, she ends up reaping years later from what she's sown by doing good unto Elisha. God blessed her for that. There's many challenges in life. Right? I mean, we all know this. There's, we, we, we face challenges all the time. That's what life is, a series of challenges. I don't know anybody who, who does not face, you know, hard times, challenges in their life. Everybody goes through some things. Everybody. And this woman's no different. This woman actually faced many challenges. And what I like about this is that there's two different ways that you can view the life of this Shunammite woman. There's two ways. There's one way it's presented in the Bible. It's very positive. But think about this. If you look at the stories this way, you can look at this woman. She had no child for years and years and years. She wanted a child real bad and just didn't have a child, right? And then she finally has a son, then he dies at a young age. Then there's a famine that forces her to leave her home. And then when she comes back, she has to go and try to fight just to get her property back because someone else would take it over. Now, if we just look at the story in terms of just the events that happen, you can look at this, it could sound very depressing. You can see how, you, how easily a person might have a really bad attitude about their life and about things that are going on in their life. Well, why does all this stuff just have to happen to me? However, none of her challenges are portrayed as a burden 
or very depressing in the Bible. Why? Because they're all victories. She faced a lot of challenges. We face a lot of challenges. But don't let the challenge discourage you. Don't let the trial get you down, get you depressed. Look for the outcome. Look for the end of the matter. She went, you no, know, look, it's, it's never fun going through the famine. It's never fun dealing with the death. It's not fun, you know, wanting something so bad like a child and not receiving that. It's not fun. But you can get through all these things and get through them with a great outcome when you can maintain your faith and the right outlook and the right perspective on things. See, she still had, even when she had no child, she was still helping people out. She was still doing good unto others. She was still helping out the man of God. She was still believing him. She wasn't asking for anything for herself either. Remember when she came to him and when he came to her, after she had done all this stuff for him, she's like, well, what do you want me to do for you? Do you want me to speak unto the king for you? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine living right here. Everything's good. I don't need anything. She never asked him of one thing for herself. And it wasn't until Gehazi, his servant, said, hey, you know, she doesn't have a, a child and she'd really like to have a child. And then that's when she received that blessing. See, she had a great spirit. She had a right outlook. She had a right temperament. And no matter what she was facing, she didn't let that get her down. And she reacted. Remember, even when her, when her son died, she didn't just crawl up in a ball and curl up and just want to die. She went to the man of God. She still went to seek out that help. She still continued to go in the right direction and didn't let that just screw up and mess up her entire life. And we see as a result of that, these victories that come. The challenges are going to come no matter what, but it's how you deal with those challenges that's going to really determine the outcome. This woman wanted to have a child, didn't have one. But she still did her best. She did what she could. She did good, especially to Elisha, the household of faith, as I mentioned already. And as a result of her sowing righteously, she was blessed with a child. She had him revived when he, was dead, when he died. He, she was warned about the famine. And then she received all of her goods back upon her return. There are so many things that could have been really bad. They turned out really good. And it's all, I believe it's all completely a result of her faith and her doing right and just walking the right path the best way that she could. And uh, it, there, is, there is no coincidence here. It's not just some random thing that they happen to be talking about Elisha and this child being raised back to life when he's like, hey, this is her and her son. I mean, the son that was, was still with her then when she came back. Like, this is, the, this is the kid that was brought back to life. And it made a big impact. And that's why, you know, this story doesn't really seem to fit in with everything else that's going on, but it's brought in here to teach us a lesson. It's brought back. We're familiar with this person. We know the stories that happened. She faces even more problems, but God worked everything out in the long run. God made everything work because of her faith, because of the way that she was um, staying true and consistent to to God's word and, and keeping that faith in God's word. Let's keep reading here now. We're going to move on to the next section. Verse number seven. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come hither. Jonathan, sit down. Verse eight. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand and go. Meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, 40 camels burden, and came and stood before him and said, Thy son Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, hath sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Now this is real interesting that Elisha ends up in Damascus and Ben-Hadad, the king of, remember, Syria and, and Israel have been at war a lot. In their, I mean, even, you know, especially through these times, Syria is the one who has, had besieged the city. And here we see Ben-Hadad is, is seeking out counsel from Elisha. And he's like, go to the man of God. Because, and, and see, here's the thing, whether he even believed or not, Elisha was known 
to be, I mean, the other nations knew who Elisha was just because of his works, because of, you know, he was able to tell the king, hey, here's where, here's where they're going to be. Here's where the enemy is going to be. Here's where the armies are going to be located. And they all knew it's Elisha doing that. They, they'd heard about the miracles that he performed. They heard about all these great stories of Elisha, the man of God. So even the unbelievers, even the pagans were going, hey, you know, it doesn't take much when you're involved in a pagan religion, especially, you know, the older you get, you start seeing like, there's nothing happening. It's all just a bunch of superstition. But this man has the great power of God. So when he went to ask anybody anything, he's like, go ask Elisha. That guy at least has some, that guy is, is evidently has some power with God. And um, of course, he sends them then with like this great, he says, take a present in thine hand. And it says he brought them um, 40 camels. Burst. So remember, loading up a camel. 40 camels is all kinds of stuff, all kinds of goods. It's just this, this, uh, this gift in order to receive, um, just, to, just to hear whether or not he's going to be healed, whether or not he's going to recover, and um, looking to gain favor with Elisha that way. And um, Elisha answers him. You know, he sends Hazael. Hazael's one of his officers. Ben-Hadad's the king. Ben-Hadad's in charge, and he sends Hazael. And verse 10, Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. So basically what, what Elisha is saying is that, yeah, this disease that he has is not going to kill him. He will, he'll recover of that disease, except he's going to die. And then he goes on to clarify that, verse 11, And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And his ale said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, he told me that thou shouldest surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died and his ale reigned in his stead. So Ben-Hadad's real sick. He receives word from Elisha. Yep, you'll recover. But Elisha tells his ale, you know, that he was going to be king. If you remember, Elijah was told to anoint Hazael king over Syria way back earlier at the end of the book of 1 Kings. We had, we'd gone through the Bible study on that. And he was told to anoint Jehu and to anoint Hazael and to anoint Elisha. Now we saw him anoint Elisha that came and, and carried down the torch and kind of carried the mantle of, of Elijah. But we didn't see these other two things happening because Jehu, we're going to see Jehu in the next chapter. And then uh, Hazael here, finally, Elisha's basically anointing him king and he's telling him he's going to be the king. And um, again, we don't know. You can't, you know, you can't play an arm, you know, armchair quarterback here on what would have happened if Elijah had gone and anointed him earlier. But we see wicked things now coming from his ale. And he basically tells, you know, Elisha starts crying. He starts weeping. And his ale's like, you know, why are you crying? And uh, it says because he knows all the evil things that he's going to do. You see, he's going to dash their children. He's going to kill the children. He's going to rip up the women and, and do all, you know, basically come in and destroy Israel and do it very brutally, right? And, and, and be a very, very gruesome slaughter of the children of Israel. And, uh, and Hazael is like, of course, he's sitting here going like, what do you think I'm a dog? You know, like, I would never do that. Like, why are you saying these things? I would never do that. And then Elisha tells him, well, you're going to be king over, over Syria. So I said, the Lord showed me. So Elisha goes back home. Or I mean, excuse me. Hazael goes back to Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad, hey, well, what did he say? Oh, yeah, you're going to recover. Or he didn't tell him any, anything else after that. Oh, yeah, you're just going to recover. And then he murders him. He kills him uh, the next day. So um, I want to make, an, before we continue any further, I need to make a note. This, this chapter and these chapters, the, the, the events that happen in history 
get pretty complicated. <laughs> I've been spending quite a bit of time getting everything clear and trying to get my head wrapped around all these events. One of the reasons being, I don't know if you remember a uh, month ago, hopefully you remember, it wasn't that long ago, I preached a sermon on um, supposed discrepancies in the Bible, right? And I went through all these different things that the atheists like to say, or people say well, there's, there's errors in the Bible, and they come up with all these various things. And there was one that I mentioned, because I was just going through a list that I had found online, and there was one that I found that I didn't really feel like I had a good answer for. So I've been trying to figure this thing out for a while. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you I have the right answer tonight, but I don't. But this, and see, the reason is because there's a lot of stuff going on here. Now, one of the things that gets confusing to try to get everything clear in your head on what's going on here is that there are names, there are two names used, sometimes even more, for the same person. And at this particular time, you have two kings that have the same name. So you have a king of Israel and a king of Judah that both have the name of Joram or Jehoram. When you read Joram or Jehoram, those names are used interchangeably. And it's not one referring to one king and one the other. No, that would be too easy. <laughs> they both are basically the same name, Joram, Jehoram. But then you also have to make sure when you're reading it, which king is it referring to? Because they reigned essentially around the same time. You know, one came up first, but then you have them both reigning. So trying to get your timelines together and you're comparing the, the books of the Kings with the books of the Chronicles and trying to get all of the information that you can, it makes it a little bit confusing. And there was a lot of stuff going on here. So I'm going to do my best. I'm going I'm to share with you everything that I've learned so far because it, it's... And you know, the, the stuff that gets a little bit more complicated, in my opinion, I love this stuff the best because you end up learning stuff that's like super awesome in Scripture when you, when you really dig into this and start to get to learn everything. Another reason that makes this somewhat confusing is that from the, from the time that the, the kingdom was split into two, there were two distinct lines of kings. I mean, you had, um, you know, David's line. You had King Saul, but Saul was replaced with David, right? Then you had David, Solomon, Rehoboam. And then during Rehoboam's reign is when it split. Judah and Israel. And Israel, that's when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, began to reign. And we've been going through a lot of the stories. And in Israel, that line doesn't stay true because you have other people coming in and committing conspiracies. You had Amri come in and, and, and kill other people. So there's, there's various things going on here. But at this point, when it comes to Ahab and Jehoshaphat, remember Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, Ahab king of Israel. Ahab's a wicked king. Jehoshaphat made affinity with Ahab. Remember that? It was a few weeks ago we were talking about that. And what that means is he married into Ahab's family. So now you start to get a merger of the two kings' lines through the children that are a result, a real resultant through that marriage. All the way up to the here where we have um, Jehoram, who was also a son-in-law. So not only, he's, he was, his mother was Athaliah, Athaliah was of the house of Amri, wicked, you know, that, that king of Ahab from Amri is where Ahab came from in Israel. Athaliah was a daughter of Ahab, who is the mother of Joram or Jehoram in Judah. And his fatherly line goes through Jehoshaphat. So he's born of these two kings' lines. And I think that, you know, and that might be one of the reasons why we have that discrepancy. The discrepancy that I'm referring to, I haven't mentioned it yet, is Ahaziah, his son, when he begins to reign. In 2 Kings, it says he was uh, 22 years old. And then in 2 Chronicles, he says he was 42 years old. So you say, wait a minute, how old was he? Right? And 
I'm going to explain that. Well, I'll just go through a little bit now. Um, one of the reasons that, that I've heard, and I'm not sure if this is necessarily true, is that um, they're saying, oh, well, that 42 years is referring to the time of Amri's line. Now, I don't really buy into that necessarily, but it's, it's an interesting theory. But here, because of these things, and you're trying to get your, your timeline straight, there's even a, a portion, I think I have in my notes, where Jehoshaphat is referred to as the king of Israel. But he wasn't the king of Israel, he was the king of Judah. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on about it. And look, try to stay with me because this is, I know a little bit, it's, it's a little bit dry, but I just recommend you guys going home and studying this stuff out and, and try to get this all, because you want to get these people clear. It's going to help you have a better understanding of everything that's going on and get some extra insight into these stories. Let's keep reading here, though. I'm going to read. I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, jo Joram and Jehoram, don't let that confuse you. They're both the same name. So let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. So you see Joram of Ahab, Jehoram of Jehoshaphat. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. So Jehoram, and that's who is referring to here, Joram, or Jeho Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, reigns for eight years and does very, very wickedly. Keep your finger here. I want to turn to 2 Chronicles 21. We're going to see a little bit more insight on how wicked uh, Jehoram actually is for these eight years that he reigns. And, and one of the reasons it gives for him being so wicked is that he married one of the daughters of Ahab, who was extremely wicked himself. And um, followed after the ways of the kings of Israel, the wicked kings of Israel. Second Chronicles 21, keep your place in both places. We're going to flip back and forth a little bit between Second Chronicles 21 and Second Kings 8. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. And he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah and Jehiel and Zechariah and Azariah and Michael and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. And their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword and divers also of the princes of Israel. So we see Jehoram doing some extreme, I mean, he, he killed his, his brothers. His own flesh and bone, his own, fle his own fleshly brothers, he didn't want anybody to, to challenge his right to the throne. Joshua had, had many children. After jo you know, Joshua's dead, he gets a kingdom because he's the firstborn. So he really didn't have anything to worry about anyways because that's typically what happened is the firstborn son would, would then succeed the king. But he's so wicked, he decided to just, it says he strengthened himself he slew all his brethren and, it says, also of the princes of Israel. So he's killing people on Israel's side and on Judah's side. Go back, if you would, to 2 Kings, chapter 8. Keep your finger there because we're going to go back to 2 Chronicles. Verse number 19 of chapter 8. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. So even though Jehoram is extremely wicked, God says, well, I'm not going to just completely destroy Judah because David was right. And again, this goes back to show you how, how much one person's life can impact so many other people even after your passing. If you have a reason to live right and live faithfully and do great things for God in this life, think about it. It's not only what you do in your own lifetime that you'll have an impact on. You could have impact on future generations by you being a man after God's own heart, by you doing what's right and just saying, I'm going to live my life to fully serve the Lord. You do that, you can have impact on generation after generation after you. It's possible. We see that with David. It's for David's sake he didn't destroy Judah. Why? Because he made a promise unto him. 
And he made a promise unto him because he was... Um, Anyways, we're getting, I'm getting all that. So God decided not, you know, he's, he's going to let him, even though Jehoram is extremely wicked, he's going to let him go. Verse number 20, in his, in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zair and all the chariots with him, and he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots. And the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time. And the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now flip back, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 21. We're going to read a little bit more about Jehoram or Joram. And um, we get a little bit more information in 2 Chronicles 21. As a result of his wickedness, that's why these other nations now are starting to revolt. They had control over them. They had peace in the land. They, had, you know, they, were, they were controlling all these different lands. And now Edom's revolting. Libna's revolting. You know, people are, are not wanting to be um, ruled over by this wicked king. And, uh, of course, that's of God. Let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number 11 of 2 Chronicles 21. Verse number 11. Moreover, he made, this is again talking about Joram. He made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. This is more of the wickedness of Jehoram. And this is extremely, this is a great nugget here in the Bible. Verse number 12, And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but hast walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and hast made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring, like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also hast slain thy brethren of thy father's house, which were better than thyself. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people and thy children and thy wives and all thy goods, and thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day." This is a message from Elijah. Now look, Elijah was already taken up in a whirlwind by this point because Elisha's been doing all of his things. Remember, Elisha wasn't off on his own until Elijah was already taken up. And if you're not paying attention, you can miss that. And see, some people will point to this and say, oh, see, look, the Bible's got another problem with it. There's another contradiction here. How could Elijah write him a letter when he's already dead or he's already gone? Well, because it says that it says there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet. It doesn't mean that Elijah sent the letter right on that day, right at that time. He had already prophesied this. He had already set up for the king to receive this letter after he was already going to be gone. I, I mean, that's amazing. That's the only way this could have happened. I think that's amazing. That's incredible to have this prophecy already lined up. Elijah knows he's going to be gone. And he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. You need to, to give this letter to, to such, you know, at this time. It, it kind of reminds me of, um, I, I don't know if you guys saw the Back to the Future. I think it was like part two or something like that where the guy comes and he delivers a letter. He's like, I don't know. I was told just to come here at this time and deliver this letter here because, it, you know, they've been traveling back and forth through time. But see, that's a movie. That's fiction. That's talking about time travel. I mean, the, the, the scenario makes sense when you think about time travel. But see, God knows the beginning from the end, which is why he's actually able to make something like this a reality and make this happen. Because, I mean, that's why, that's why you have people like Daniel prophesying about times that haven't even happened, you know, haven't even come to pass yet. Because God has revealed unto them. He showed it to them. And, you know, in a sense, you could say, we got a letter delivered unto us from Daniel. We got a letter delivered unto us. You know, it's Jehoram had a letter delivered unto him from Elijah the prophet, outlining how wicked he was going to be, outlining, hey, this is what's going to happen. Here's your curse. Because God knows the beginning from the end. And he, he's, he's given these plagues and he's told he's going to have this great sickness and disease until, uh, and that he's just going to die by that disease. Verse number 16 says, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. So it wasn't even just the Edomites or, and, the, um, and Libna that revolted. There's also the Arabians. You've got the Philistines. 
It says, And they came up into Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house, and his sons also, and his wives, so that there was never a son left him save Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. Now here we, we would have to infer that Jehoahaz is Ahaziah. This is the only time you see Jehoahaz in the Bible, uh, uh, in, this, in this lineage, as being the only son left of Joram. And after all this, verse 18, the Lord smote him in his bowels with an incurable disease. And it came to pass that in process of time, after the end of two years, his bowels fell out by reason of his sin. What a, what a horrible way to die. For two years, having that bowel problems until your bowels just fall out. But that's what happened. It says, uh, you know, I mean, he was so wicked. He was, he was cursed of God for this. So he died of his sore diseases and his people made no burning for him like the burning of his fathers. 32 years old was he when he began to reign and he reigned in Jerusalem eight years and departed without being desired. You know what that means? No one really, everyone was kind of glad when he left. No one cared. No one made a big deal about him dying. They're like, oh, Joram died. Yeah, well, let's move on with our lives now with no lamenting, no sorrow. He departed without being desired, howbeit they buried him in the city of David, but not in the sepulchers of the kings. So he wasn't even being considered to be worthy of being buried with the other kings of Judah, even though he was, I mean, he was a king. And all of these little bits of information that we pick up, go back if you would, keep a finger here in 2 Chronicles, we'll go back one more time. Go back to 2 Kings 8. These little bits of information are important to kind of retain when we get to this issue of how old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And why is that 42 years even mentioned? Because he, had to, he was definitely 22 years old when you're talking about his age. There's no mistakes in the Bible, but his, uh, his dad, Jehoram, said so he was 32 years old when he began to reign. He reigned eight years, so that puts him at 40 years old. So there's no way that his son could be 42 years old when he begins to reign, right? So it's, it's extremely obvious that his literal age can't be 42 years old. At least when he first comes in to be the king. There's a theory out there, and I've heard this, I've actually been trying to study this out, is that the reason why it gives two different years is because there's basically a 20-year gap. So he, when he first came to reign, he first comes into power, then the Syrians come and take over so that nobody's reigning in Judah. And then when he comes back into power again, he's 42 years old. So I'm throwing that out there, and there's, there's, there's actually some good reason for that. When you think of um, no, I'm not convinced on this. Just so you know, I'm, I'm throwing it out there because I think this whole situation is extremely interesting. I love digging into this stuff and I want to give you some homework to look into for yourself. But, um, man, where, oh, there it is. But you remember when Elisha prophesied all the things that Hosea was going to do, I mean, he was really going to do a lot of destruction to Israel and to Judah. And, and he was going to be getting victories over them. So it's entirely possible. He did get, and, and what we see here also is that um, Ahaziah goes to battle with the king of Israel, with Jehoram. And they lose. And Jehoram, well, let's read it. 2 Kings chapter 8, look at verse number 24. And Joram slept with his father. So the, just, the, again, this is the Joram that's the, um, the son of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. So again, in order to be a son-in-law, he would have had to have married into that house as well. So he's the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went with Joram, 
the son of Ahab. So this is the other Joram, the king of Israel. Ahaziah yokes up with Joram, the king of Israel, son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, king of Syria, in Ramoth-Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. So the Syrians were able to, to wound the king, the king of Israel. And had basically gone and, and essentially were taking over Ramoth-Gilead. So verse 29 says, And King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. Now, flip over, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 22. In order for this theory to make sense that there's a 20-year gap, because I'm not saying that I subscribe to this, but it's a very interesting possibility. You would say, at this moment, Hazael has defeated Israel and Judah enough to the point to where you could consider them not really reigning anymore, that he's ended their reign because he's now controlling or has dominion over them to one, you know, one degree or another to where now they've become the head, right? Whether, even if they don't have them completely in domination, they've, they've defeated them sufficiently to be considered that they are no longer king, the kings of, of their sovereign land, right? Um, so then Joram has to retreat and goes to Jezreel because he's wounded, but the only way I can see his fitting is, is halfway through this verse 29 when Ahaziah goes to visit Joram in Jezreel. It says because he was sick. And that sickness being different than the actual wounds. So that the time has, has gone by where he was wounded and then you know years later he comes because at this meeting is when Jehu comes and kills um, Joram and Ahaziah. They both are eliminated at that, essentially at that meeting. So in order for them both to be killed at this meeting, there would have had to be 20 years going by for then Ahaziah to, to come back into, into reigning in, in Syria, not having control over them anymore. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 22, verse number one. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah's youngest son king in his stead, for the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the elders. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. For, and this is where it says, Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. So this is where you could get that theory of 20 missing years. And possibly because Syria was reigning over Israel and Judah after losing uh, in battle at Ramoth Gilead after, after Israel and Judah lost that battle. Um, something to consider, right? I mean, obviously, for me and for many other people I know, you, know, you come to realize there are no contradictions and errors in the Bible. They're just not there. I've been confronted with so many different errors, and then when you actually see, you know, read and understand, say, like, oh, okay, well, that's actually not an error at all. It's just people's, you know, misunderstanding of what it, of what it's actually saying. And it's easy to get you kind of twisted off on the wrong path in many of those cases. And I'm not gonna repreach that sermon, but you can see how like. If you, if you insert a certain thought or a certain way of thinking about it, it could seem to contradict. It could seem to be a big problem. Just, I mean, James 2 is a perfect example of that. You know, can faith save them? Oh, faith without works is dead. You're trying to say, oh, well, see, look, this, bio, this is where it's saying you have to have works and everything else in order to be saved. And when you got someone really trying to spin it in this sense of you have to believe in a works-based salvation, it can mess with your head a little bit until you actually take the time to say, no, 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 let's just get exactly what this is saying. Read the whole context. Look up all the examples. We're talking about Abraham. What's this talking about? And then you realize, no, 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 it's not talking about your soul being saved because of your works at all. It's just people spin it. 
And it's not, a, so it's, it's not a contradiction either. It's just people who don't understand what it's saying. Oh, I got my notes screwed up here. Where did, did I return back to uh, 2 Kings chapter 8? Oh yeah, that was that was the end of the chapter. So I'm not missing it. I'm, I'm like, where's my where's my last page of notes? That was my last page of notes. So let's wrap this up and summarize here. When you you know this this deals with one of those issues with Ahaziah. How old was he? Or one one account says 22 years old. The other account says 42 years old. When you go back and look through, and, and I do recommend you studying this out and look at how the lines get blurred between the kingly lines. And then you also, there's so many other things that are interesting about this. When you look through, um, I believe it's the, the Matthew genealogy and look at the people who are left out in the, in the line to Jesus Christ, you know, the line of David. These people here are left out. It's, um, I think Joram's left out. You know, from Jehoshaphat. It's, you know, just, well, I don't want, I don't know. Oh no, Joram's there. Jehoshaphat begat Joram and Joram begat Ozias. All right, I'm getting screwed up now on the... There's a, there's a few other places that, that have references to, to these men and, and uh, or actually lack of references to their, to their account and them being um, the chronology and being considered kings. And um, what I, I didn't have that theory the last time when I preached a sermon about the possible contradictions about the 20-year gap, but it is a possibility because you have both kings then they reigned for their eight years or for their 12, you know, for their, um, their one year and their 12 years. And then that's it. And then both of them are dead and, and Jehu and uh, Athaliah start reigning after that moment. So um, it's really important to study, you know, study the words. Don't let people trip you up. Um, but dig in and get to know the characters, get to know who these people are. Do the comparisons between the Chronicles and the Kings. It gives you a much fuller picture of everything that's going on here. And honestly, this has gotten me to want to even study more history, ancient history about the, the Syrians and about everything else that was going on during this time because this is all, this is all real history. This is all um, things that actually happened. It'd be interesting to see what else was going on in the world around them at this time and how powerful Syria had really gotten to be. And how, and I think what's going to happen is you'll see when you go that route how much more amazing it is when God protects them and God delivers them out of the hands of these kings that had so much power and had so much to be able to just wipe out a kingdom like Israel or Judah because ultimately they didn't really have that much power and influence in many of the, the years of their existence when these great nations came up against them and God was able to deliver them. So let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for all these, these various um, nuances and, and things we can learn from your word, dear God. I pray that you please help us to have the faith that the, uh, the woman of Shunem had, Lord, to be able to just deal with all the challenges that arise in our life and to just trust in you and to, and to do what's right and to sow good things so that later on we could, we could reap good things, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just uh, help us to study, to show ourselves approved unto you, dear Lord, that we can study your word, not just read the Bible. Lord. We all ought to be reading the Bible every day. We ought to be getting into your word and hearing from you, dear God. But I pray that you please help us also to study and to, and to receive more wisdom that you'd open up our understanding 
to some of these things, uh, especially some of the, the, the deeper um, wisdom and knowledge that we can learn through, through our studies, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to get a, a proper, full understanding of everything that's going on in Scripture, dear Lord, and that we would uh, especially get the stuff that's, you know, a lot of these things are pretty cool to, to recognize and to see, but Lord, help us to, um, to ultimately make the applications that, that we could have knowledge and wisdom that's going to be useful in our lives, that we could um, just serve you better and be able to answer any of the, the, the critics and, and be able to provide a reason for our faith, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.